Good evening and welcome once again to Insight Live. Tonight we are going to discuss the topic when heaven meets earth and what do we do when words are not enough, when our emotions or feelings take us captive, when God doesn't seem to be there for us in a particular moment. What do we do? Um, we can turn to friends, we can turn to various ways to alleviate that, but in the end, I believe we need a touch from heaven. I believe that we need a revelation from God. And it's amazing, the Apostle Paul didn't only just talk about studying your Bible and so on, but he talked about, he prayed that God would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and know him better. So I believe in my personal walk with God, I felt those touches from heaven where words have failed, where my emotions have failed, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight when heaven meets earth and, and touches us via an incredible revelation from God himself. Well, it's a warm welcome to you from me, Melanie, and uh, Tuesday nights is always wonderful to join uh, you in your homes at uh, this time. And actually, we have a fantastic second appearance by um, a well-known author, David Oliver, and you may remember we had him on Insight Live before. So, but this time he is joined via Skype with his beautiful wife, Jill, and uh, he's the popular author of all about heaven mm -hmm. and uh, this was actually how heaven broke through for them after they lost their son so we are looking forward to interviewing them Kurt and uh, actually having Jill's perspective on how heaven broke through for them uh, during their tragedy it, it, it's amazing you know when this happens to couples and not just couples but entirely entire families everybody has their they process it differently mm -hmm. like I remember when I lost my mom eight years ago um, well my brother called me up and said that my mother is dying and I had to get on the plane and go over and just as I was boarding the plane my brother called me up and said well Kurt mom mom died and my other siblings were there but but I missed that and you know for me it was strange I, I just took everybody out to a Mexican restaurant had a good time we had a good time remembering all the good times that we had w with my mother whereas another friend of mine well I'm, I'm thinking of two friends they both lost their mothers and their world just fell apart. I, I, I mean, they went from here, it was just a downward spiral for them, whereas for me, it was strange, I processed it entirely different. It, it just taught me how valuable life was. And, you know, a lot of times people would say, well, Kurt, don't you have any feelings? You should cry more. But I did have feelings. I had feelings of, of joy, because I was remembering those joyful times with my mother. Mm. You know, losing a son or a daughter, that would be something entirely different. When our son was suffering with leukemia, we almost lost him five times. And I remember when he was first diagnosed with leukemia, and reading between the lines, the doctors were kind of saying, he's going to die. And I was looking at pictures of him, and I'm saying, oh, God, am I prepared for this? And he's your son, he's not my... It, it's just so hard. It's, it's such a process. You want to yell at God, you want to tear your hair out. It, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's something so difficult to process. But in the Psalms, mm -hmm. you have all mm -hmm. of those battles. And that's what I love about the Bible. It's not sugar-coated. It deals with those raw emotions because you know the storms will will hit us in life and we have to be as prepared as we can mm. i think having that strong foundation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. our faith is so so important i think that i think it tells us a lot about ourselves as well and how we are able to to process tragedy and uh, and to rely on god i think it's kind of interesting because i i operate in a different way when there is an emergency or when there's a tragedy or something, I kick into, uh, I suppose, the nurse mode, the, the, the emergency mode, and everything is just, I, I'm just in, in my functional mode. So I don't give myself an opportunity straight away to, to, to feel. I just, I know this, this, and this has to be done, and I need to do it. Whereas Kurt is a, he just he completely, uh, you know, deal, deals with things differently. But then when it plateaus out, that's when I have to really deal with actually what am I really feeling and how is God there in the middle with me and actually a lot of people you know actually commented when we were um, you know going through 
this with our son Kyle, and they said, well, why haven't you, you know, uh, given God up? You know, how, how can you still follow God after this? I'm going, how can I not follow God? This certainly mm. is a book, and it's so readable. And it's not one of these, like, doctrinaire books, like, I am from this denomination, and I'm going to prove my doctrine, and this is what heaven is like. But, uh, you know, David wrote it because of the death of his son. Mm. You mm -hmm. know, it was exploratory thing. He, he wrote it from a very, you know, not a, not a high fluted plateau, but from a very humble, God, I'm hungry, I, I need to know, is, is heaven for real? You know, I want to know about heaven. And what he found out about heaven just shattered his mm -hmm. kind of Sunday school theology about heaven. And well, like, well, I think there's two things. Yeah. I mean, we, have, we actually have what we sometimes learn through tradition and then there's actually the biblical concept when you delve into it and actually it's far more real and it's far more kind of earthy than we, we expect yeah, yeah. it to be. It, it, in fact, I said on, on the last show when, when I taught at Bible College, I would ask a lot of my students, you know, to describe heaven from a biblical perspective, <laughs> and nobody could do it. Not a single one could do it. On the clouds they, playing they, harps. Yeah, because they read all you know these kind of heaven tourism books and yeah. so on, and this and that and that and that. And that. So it, it didn't really correspond to what was in the Bible. And I think that's why the show was so popular, because it just kind of said, whoa, wow, this is a, amazing what the Bible says about heaven. So let's go over to um, David and Jill right now. Well, hello, everybody. Good there to see you. you. Uh, a huge welcome, Jill. We've had David on before. David, I'm sure our viewers are really happy to have you on again. But a, a warm welcome from our Revelation TV viewers and especially our Insight Live viewers. They are, are very, very faithful followers of what we bring every Tuesday. And such a privilege to have you both on. Jill, a very special welcome to you. We uh, think you're a very brave woman to come on mm -hmm. with us. And we're going to be asking you some very intimate questions. And I just know that our viewers are going to just connect with you, connect with your mother's heart, connect with you as a sister in the Lord, and, and be able to just journey a little bit and, and get some comfort from your perspective. And of course, David, we're going to be hearing more about uh, you know, some things that have been going on in your heart. Uh, more about your book, of course. We can't wait uh, for our viewers to start kind of buying more, more of your books and giving them to uh, their friends and, uh, and family, uh, you know, to bring uh, just a different perspective. At Christmas, you know, we, we look at uh, what's happening at Christmas and a baby is born, but a lot of people are suffering right now. And they are, as Kurt said, asking questions about heaven. They're asking the reality of what happens after we die and we shed this this kind of mortal body so i think this is a very timely uh visitation yeah. of yours yeah. <laughs> so big big welcome you're welcome to wave to our viewers and say hi <laughs> hi <laughs> yeah maybe they should say merry christmas because look at us not yeah. yet not yet not, not yet, yet. <laughs> not yet but um david and jill just for the sake of the viewers if you could kind of summarize what took place why this book um, well, David can say why the book, but I could, I could briefly summarize. Um, Joel was 38 years old and three months, and he became unwell in September 2018. And then trips backwards and forwards to the GP, uh, to, the, to the general practitioner, and then a hospital admission, followed by sending him home, more drugs. Um, and if, I'll cut a long story short, but finally he called us um, on the 27th of um, November and said, um, I have some very bad news. Um, the doctors know now that I do have a cancer and it might not be operable. And uh, that was on Friday. And then on Monday he called them and said, are you sitting down because the news is worse? And he said, the cancer is so bad, but they don't know where it is. But I only have between two weeks and six months to live. Um, and he actually only lived 17 more days. And we, we as a whole family nursed him during those 17 days. We moved lots of and barrel to Darlington and then to the James Cook, where he was moved to. And uh, we nursed him there. And... Uh, people have said, how are you so so good? How, how are you doing so well? And I can tell you 
categorically, it's because people are praying for us. I know if we didn't have the support of people around us, we wouldn't be in the place that we're in. Um, and we wouldn't have um, come through it as we have without the prayers of people and the very good friendship that people I have. A friend who texts me nearly every, every day to just one or two lines to find out how I am. She stays really close to me. Mm. So that's that's been very special. But how about how you wrote the book? Yeah, so you can see a picture of Joel just over Jill's uh, right shoulder, and he was full of health, <laughs> vitality, vibrant, adventurous, courageous, my best friend, work companion, church ministry companion. We would speak every day, write emails every day. And when he began to show signs of serious illness grief began to set in already then and i think we can talk about that momentarily but we got to the final hour then the final minutes then the final second and the final seconds i had the privilege as a dad of speaking over him the words that i felt were so appropriate for him and words that then became a feature of the book which was you have run the race son fought the fight and there is a crown waiting for you go get it and as those last words left my lips his last breath left his and as i laid my head against his still slightly warm beard troubling questions began to surface in my mind where has joel actually gone what is he doing how did he get there and how come as a church minister, a preacher and speaker for four decades, I'm even asking these questions. How come? I don't know. And I resolved very soon after that to write whatever I discovered in scripture. And the book uh, that you've finally shown people is the result of that journey. And it's interesting. Most Christians know about the new heaven and the new earth. Almost no Christians have ever heard a message on what I've come to call present heaven, the place that Jesus, John, and Paul called paradise, the place that your loved ones and mine, if they follow Christ, will go to when they die. So those were the opening ingredients, as it were, both of research and the writing process. Yeah. I think, sorry, can I just say, so, so one of the things that you just remind me of is, you know, obviously the um the thief on the cross because that was always one of my questions was well you know okay people have fallen asleep god's outside of time does that mean they are in limbo until the new jerusalem comes and then of course when you look at what jesus you know uh, you know said, uh, said today you will be uh, with me in paradise i suppose you know as you're talking that that's kind of the thing where you kind of you wonder well what what is that and what does it look like you know yeah. yeah, the book covers that in, in detail, both from a biblical point of view and also what I call the trip advisor of views. People in the family of churches, by and large, that we're involved in, in other words, people we know, people who are not celebrities, but who've had what are called NDEs or out-of-body experiences where they've actually died and are gone to present heaven or paradise. And you get the same kind of glimpse Obviously, the biblical narrative is totally trustworthy. It's what we base our faith and our understanding on. But these TripAdvisor reviews are remarkably similar, mm -hmm. and they tell a very similar story. And we get the glimpses of this from Jesus on the cross today, you will be with me in paradise. Paul himself had an experience. He calls the location of his experience paradise. And it's from that experience, because of the surpassing greatness of it in other words the gobsmacking or inspiring experience of it that he is given a thorn in the flesh to keep him earthbound <laughs> maybe it would have spoiled his apostolic ministry maybe he would have longed to go too much who knows <laughs> but it was that experience which produced the scripture that you'll hear preachers use uh, to live is christ to die is gain i desire to depart and be with christ which is better by far and then in the book of Revelation, John also calls it paradise. And you get a commentary on both this stopover, as I call it, 
and the final destination, mm. the new heaven and the new earth. Mm. But this stopover, like many stopovers on a long journey, is wonderful. It's amazing. It's better than the best we've ever experienced. Mm. And it most definitely is not my soul in a coma or my soul asleep. Yes, mm. my body sleeps, but my spirit lives. Healing Jairus' daughter, Jesus said, her spirit returned, or the writer said, her spirit returns. Can't return if it's asleep. Yeah. The story of Lazarus and Abraham, they're both conscious. Mm. Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah and Elijah are both conscious, recognizable. They can talk and mm. they have a form. So lots more to be said about that in the book, but paradise mm. is the stopover. The new heaven and the new earth is our final destination. And just that simple understanding was a huge liberating window into heaven for Jill and myself. Mm. Wow. So, so Jill, did you find that, you know, as you were, I suppose you've been on the journey, uh, you know, with David as he's been writing this, and then obviously you've searched the scriptures yourself as well, you've, you've received comfort from the Lord. Did you find that specifically um, for you, uh, a, a revelation that actually, uh, and, and a comfort that your son would be in this paradise situation uh, straight away as, as soon as he left his body? Um, I, did, I didn't walk the journey when Dave was writing the book, but um, when uh, we talked after Joel had died, I said, please don't tell people we've lost our son, because when you, when you give birth, the midwife gives you the child, and generally now they, you hold the baby skin to skin, but you, the midwife gives you the child. And when... Um, Joel was dying, I, I had felt that I was giving Joel to God mm. and he took him. And I said, he's not lost. I know where he is because I've given him back to God. I know where he is. So I, I had that certainty. Um, yeah. We were remarking just, just before we came on air with your first questions that you're talking about heaven meeting earth. And uh, there's some wonderful thoughts around that. But before we maybe even go there, we both said to each other, it, it didn't feel like that a lot of the time. And there are moments, I mean, the Holy Spirit, we're told, and I, I saw this for the first time writing the book, is sent where from? From heaven. The angels that you referred to with Jacob and the many scores of illustrations in the Bible, they're sent from heaven. Heaven is God's address. Uh, it's where his throne is, the command hub, the control center of all that is going on in God's world and God's plan and God's purpose. And he routinely sends angels to earth. And it's fascinating. We look at 27 things angels do in heaven and on earth. And the 28th, but it is only one of 28, is singing and worship, or worship, I should say. So angels bring that touch of heaven to earth. But the reality is when you're in the process of grief, it don't feel like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like what the psalm is called, though I walk through the valley of darkness. Uh, and that darkness in the Hebrew is actually the valley of deepest darkness. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we stayed with some very good friends now called Alistair and Eleanor in the last couple of weeks of Joel's life, they were looking after us so that we could go in and out to the hospital. And she said to us both, she said, grief will be like a dark tunnel. And for months, you may not even see more than the occasional tiny pinprick of light. Mm. And there will seem to be no light at the end of the tunnel. And I have to say, that valley of deepest darkness, that is the reality. And even writing the book, people said, was the book therapeutic or cathartic? Absolutely not. It was traumatizing writing it. The, uh, the pain of the memories that would come flooding back. I remember even, uh, I'd, I'd done research, more research for this book than any other of the books I've written by a long shot. Wow. Piles of books and scripture written, uh, read and digested and, you know, trying to grapple with it. 
And I'd got material and I'd been waiting for a couple of weeks and Jill said to me, well, are you going to write it? I said, it's, it's like there's almost something stopping me. And I'll never forget it. I stood at the keyboard just about two feet from where our camera is right now. And I committed to God that they would start to write the book. And this tsunami of grief, unwelcome, uninvited, mm. just overwhelming torrents of grief came pouring out of me. And Jill thought I was dying myself. She thought something was desperately wrong and came charging in. So I'm saying all that only to make the point that grief is authentic. Mm. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we esteemed him not. In other words, he wasn't the picture postcard Christian for whom grief is a non-existent, unchristian reality. No, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was one who knew what it was to weep, probably over the loss of his own father, certainly over the loss of his friend uh, Lazarus. So just to make the point, yes, heaven does meet earth. And yes, there have been connecting points, but it doesn't always feel like it. Yeah. Mm. And so, Jill, it's, it's amazing when I was reading Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations and you just see that you know, the imagery he used, he felt like he was nailed inside a coffin and, and buried alive and it was just getting darker and darker. But then he did have that moment in God where he, he, he saw some hope. But, you know, perhaps both of you have processed grief in different ways, but Jill, what was the most, I don't know, if, if you could describe your grief process, what, what were some of the most challenging uh, times that you went through and was there a time where God met you in that darkness? Yeah, there was, def definitely. Um, I, I, haven't, um, I haven't really been able to read very much since Joel died, partly concentration. Uh, anybody that's been through tra traumatic grief, which is what we went through, would understand you you just cannot have the same level of concentration that you used to um, and I didn't sleep well and I had flashbacks and flashbacks uh, for those of you that have never experienced them they're when you have had so much trauma that you're trying to shut it out in the day and it comes creeping back in at night and I would wake up in the night and I would almost be back in the room with Joel with the um, the uh, pain and trauma that he went through. I mean, he he said he felt like his body, he was just being beaten up by everything possible. Um, he, he, yeah, savaged by dogs was what he actually said. Um, and so I had flashbacks. And so I would be awake for hours every night. The only way that I could stop them was to listen to an audio, audio book. Um, just to try and, and stop this. Um, but in September, this September just gone, um, I was listening to um, a lady that I follow on YouTube called The Minimalist Mum, and she happened to say a phrase, and uh, it stuck with me and resonated. And she said, forgiveness isn't an event, it's a flow. And... I, I was just pondering on that. And a little bit later, she mentioned a quote from Oprah Winfrey, of all people, who said this, forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could have been any different. It's accepting the past for what it was and using this moment and this time to help yourself move forward. And... I had to sort of think about that a few times. It's giving up the hope, hope that the past could be anything different because what was happening with the flashbacks, I was trying to work out, could we have done something different? Should we have done something different? Should the doctors have done something different? And there were all these questions where I was trying to put the past right. And there's no way I could put the past right. So until I could express some forgiveness, um, and let go of that hope that the past could have been different because um, I knew that God was in it somehow, um, but I had been holding it against God really that he took Joel, even though I released him. And when I would hold Joel's hand in the hospital, I would pray, Lord, would you bring your healing to my son? But if you aren't gonna heal him, would you take him quickly? 
So I knew that he had taken him and I had released him, yet there was still something in me that was resentful towards God for what he had allowed to happen. Mm. And so when I, when I was pondering on that, forgiveness isn't an event, it's a flow, I thought, you know, I need to let go of this and I need to um, let go of the fact and express forgiveness toward my forgiveness towards God for holding it against him that he had taken Joel. And after I did that, I haven't had flashbacks since. I mean, I have had the occasional nights of wakefulness and I, and I would be remembering, of course, but not the flashbacks that are so intrusive and so draining um, of energy, both physically, spiritually and mentally. Mm. Wow, that's it was really interesting. Powerful. I talked to Cheryl Ann the same day, not knowing any of this, sent us a link to a Christian song, uh, which is not her normal... Uh, link, let's put it that way, and the song was Holy Water, and it was all about forgiveness, and it says, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, like the sound of a symphony to my ears, like holy water on my skin, and I watched with amazement when Joel went through this process, 17th of September this year it was, Joel died on the 20th of December 2018, and every day between 20th of December 2018 and 17th of December this year, Jill had flashbacks. She's not had one since. Wow. That's a touch from heaven mm. and three very unexpected sources, mm. but it made a difference. There was a before and there was an after, and the two are very different. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? I, I find, you know, Jeremiah, what I read, I mean, Jeremiah said, God, you violated me. You know, you said there's peace that's coming to Jerusalem, yet there's a sword at my throat. And then in Lamentations, he said, you've done this to me. You've nailed me in the coffin. And he has this incredible relationship with God. Uh, we, do we see this today? Are we encouraged? Like we, we hear Christian songs. Where is this kind of language today? This kind of good grief? Yeah. You talked about Stephen Curtis Chapman. I, I listened to his album, The Glorious Unfolding, and he said in a little piece uh, on a live gig with that album that uh, he would wake up some days and wonder if he would scream so loud over the loss of his daughter that he would lose his voice. You know, uh, this process of grief, it is different for everybody, very different. Yeah. But the depth of it, particularly when you lose a child. I lost my dad at 21. I nursed him. I lost my mother a few weeks before Joel died. That level of grief is real, but so different. You yeah. lose a son or a daughter, it cuts deeper. It's like a steel gauntlet in your soul, irrepressibly squeezing pain and tears. So, and unless you've been there, yeah. you can't get yeah. it. So we heard how Jill processed her, those sleepless nights, those flashbacks, kind of like post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress on, mm -hmm. on the battlefield, you know, re re mm -hmm. returning soldier, uh, you know, seeing bombs and, and, and all of that kind of similar. But how, was, how did you process it, uh, David? How, when did heaven meet earth for you? I think there, there's a particular instance, and you and I talked about this off camera, and I, I know you'd like me to talk about it, which I will in just a moment. I think there is a backdrop to grief, good grief, and that is a biblical foundation. If that biblical foundation is there, you stand a chance. Yes, you need the comfort of the Spirit, and yes, the nurture of good, godly friends is irreplaceable. Lots of hugs. <laughs> Lots of hugs when there's no COVID. Yeah. But... A biblical foundation for me was born when I nursed my dad. I was 21, never seen anybody die before. I was fearful of the moment of death. And when my dad died, I found myself kneeling at the foot of his bed and singing a song, which we used to sing in those days, called Your Loving Kindness is Better Than Life. It was in the Psalms, still is in the Oh, Psalms. I know that yes. song. I love that but song. <laughs> song was a revelation and what that revelation was was saying is uh, death might be on the bottle but eternal life is in the contents death is not a tragedy for the one that's gone it's the exit to life that's better by far it's the only way 
we can get out of this decaying body and into paradise. So we want to hold on to life more than anything, but actually there is a moment of exit, and that moment of exit is wonderful if yeah. you have got perspective. And alongside of that scripture, three other scriptures came in, and they've stayed with me. I was 21 then. I'm 69 now. So do the maths. It's a long time, four decades plus. Uh, the second scripture is precious in the sight of God is the death of his chosen ones. Uh, the third scripture has to, uh, <laughs> here I am looking for it, forgotten it momentarily. The, uh, <laughs> the other two scriptures are great. I can't find them, but my mind's gone. <laughs> Jill said grief impacts you. Here we go. Um, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mm. I've watched it countless times. You've, you've done that, you too, as pastors. Everyone watching who's been to a funeral of a Christian loved one has seen the amazing presence, dignity, and grace given to the family that mourns. Yes, there'll be distress and tears, but somewhere in that process, the promise of Jesus himself finds root. So blessed are those who mourn. What a paradox, for they shall be comforted. And then the fourth key, which is really important, is a key where Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death. Beautiful. Mm. I mean, what, what a... Church a, a does not hold the keys of death. Surgeons don't. Yeah. Drunk drivers don't. Incurable yeah. illness don't. Yeah. COVID doesn't on its own, he holds the keys of death. So yeah. to answer your question, I suppose, it didn't take the darkness away, but those four biblical rock-like foundations were stabilizing. But then there were moments, and the worst moment for me, where I, I found it harder even than the day of the funeral, which was desperately, desperately tough. Mm. My son and I worked on a business together, and it was a good business, is a good business. And he had the shares in it with his wife, uh, Joanna, his widow now. And after about a year following his uh, death, looking at the trajectory of the economy, the trajectory of the business itself, where it was going without him uh, in the leadership role, all the wisdom that came to me was it's time to sell his shares and Joanna's shares. That's his wife. So it's time to sell the Oliver family shareholding. And I knew it was going to be tough. It was a decision I didn't want to make. It was a decision that was kind of forced on me. And I'll, I'll never forget the moment. I had to go to the local HSBC bank in Basingstoke with my COVID mask on, the two meter separation, a very surreal experience. And I put the very fine signature, two of them, on the two final bits of paper that was the transfer of ownership of my son's business from his family to a new owners. And whilst I knew that was going to be a difficult day, I was shocked by the level of trauma that it released in me. Wow. Uh, wow. I was very angry. I found some dark places in my soul that I had never seen before. And mm. what I saw in my own soul frightened mm. me. And the undergirding premises were just very natural, but very painful. So it was the loss of a dream. That signature represented yeah. the loss of a dream. Yeah. Joel and I dreamt of growing the business large, eventually selling it up, and we had plans of what we were going to do together. I lost my job as a director in the company. I lost my consultancy arrangement wow. with the company. All of those had to be yeah. uh, laid down in order for the deal yeah. to go ahead. Yeah. And Joel and I had talked about how I would be able to extract some little reward from him for all the years of input into the business. And of mm. course, that too had mm. gone. Yeah. And I found myself comparing myself to somebody else uh, who'd managed to extract a substantial chunk of money out oh, of his time around Joel and in the business. And here I am, 
Joel's dad and there's nothing there. Yeah. And it was the worst week, I think, I can truthfully say, of my life. Deep, deep anger, deep, deep pain. And I was reading in Deuteronomy, and it's Moses pleading with God for the outcome he thought uh, was his promise. And God says this to Moses, and as I read these words, it was as if the hair on the back of my neck stood wow. up. It did actually on this occasion, wow. but one of those moments where God says to Moses, do not speak to me anymore about this matter. Wow. wow. And that was like the hand of God arresting me, that's stopping where, That's where heaven came to earth. We only have like three minutes left, so I have to kind of be sensitive. And you have something there, Melanie, yeah, so you would like yeah, to say? We do want to just, just tell the, the, the viewers about how to get your book, but I do have a, a viewer that I would like to just highlight right now while you are on and uh, perhaps you can uh, just say a short prayer for them. Thank you, Kurt and Melanie, for this program. I lost my teenage son through suicide in the first lockdown. God is doing a work. I know, especially through this, I need this and others. God has given us, like through the compassionate friends and people praying, which is lifting us and we are coping through God's grace and others' prayers. Blessings to you all. And they don't give their name. So uh, as we wrap up and uh, just console this dear, dear viewer, uh, I am sure that they have really uh, get gleaned um, just wonderful insight and comfort with your story. And so we've come to an end. We want to spend another half hour with you. <laughs> no, another hour. <laughs> but we have to just say quickly, where do we get the book from? <laughs> yeah, you get the book from davidoliverbooks.com if you're in the UK, USA or Europe. There's a little icon on the bottom of the website where you can choose your currency. So davidoliverbooks.com, uh, all about Great. heaven. And please tell that lady, yes. the fact she can talk about the suicide yep. is the first big step. Excellent. Every time we've done an evening event, one or more people have come up who've had a teenager commit suicide. They're Christian people, and over half of them have never really been able to talk about it. Well, thank wow. you so much. I just want to thank you on behalf of all the Revelation TV uh, viewers tonight on Insight Live. Thank you for sharing such a painful journey. And uh, I think, you know, we're not going to be able to get to all our emails, but I think that what you've shared is just so charged with, with encouragement and hope. So thank you so much, Jill. What a pleasure to have you share your part of the story. Thank you so much, David. We love you guys. We're looking forward to everybody buying your books for Christmas. Thank you for being with us. God okay. bless you. Okay, Merry Bye -bye. Christmas.